I'm Amy Herholt and with ExxonMobil, and I'm happy to tell you about what we've been doing in quantum. So we've been working in quantum computing research for about two years. This is in our corporate strategic research division, which is where we do long range fundamental science. And first I wanna set the stage for why this is important to ExxonMobil. So the energy industry and oil and gas in general has some very computationally intensive problems. This uh, means that we're big users of high performance computing and scientific computing in general. And so this includes many physics based modeling problems such as imaging in the subsurface and processing seismic data for oil and gas exploration, as well as modeling fluid flow in a reservoir, um, again, for oil and gas exploration computational fluid dynamics problems, which includes uh, modeling what happens inside a reactor for refining um, pipeline flow, as well as even ocean dynamics for offshore platform design. And then, of course, many computational chemistry challenges, um, including looking at the composition of crude oil as it goes through the different refinery processes, as well as designing new materials, new catalysts for making uh, chemicals and fuels. And so scientific computing is really a cornerstone technology for oil and gas, and it's going to continue to be so uh, going forward into the future. And let me tell you about why that is because of the global energy challenges going forward. So first of all, you have to understand that um, societal progress is linked to intrinsically linked to energy. Um, so safe, reliable, affordable energy is important to improve standard of livings. And so this is the uh, UN uh, Human Development Index uh, for different countries as a function of energy use per capita. And the, you know, the, the higher on the human development index a country is, the higher the energy use per capita. And in fact, today's, uh, the global population is around seven and a half billion. And about half of those people live in countries that are low to medium on the human development index, um, which means that um, as those, as that population going forward improves their standard of living, global energy demand will rise. And with that rise in global energy demand will come an increase in energy-related CO2 emissions. And so this brings us to the dual energy challenge. How do we provide the reliable, the affordable, the you know, energy at global scale to help drive human progress, while at the same time uh, reducing the CO2 footprint of energy and uh, you know, mitigating and reducing the risk of climate change? And so this is a large technology challenge as well as an opportunity. We need uh, technologies that can work at global scale. And given the importance of scientific computing and energy, um, you know, that will continue to be important going forward. And we think that there's uh, a lot of opportunity for new and emerging types of computing, including quantum computing. So let me tell you about some of the applications that um, we see for quantum computing. Um, so first of all, a big one is in chemistry modeling. So in particular, trying to design new materials to do chemistry. Um, for example, materials that can capture CO2 out of flue gas for carbon capture and storage, um, or materials to, to do um, lower CO2 footprint uh, manufacturing of fuels and chemicals. And, you know, we have lots of uh, ways currently with classical computing to do uh, computational chemistry to try and predict, um, uh, you know, uh, how materials are going to perform and guide experiments. Um, for, they work well for certain classes of materials, but for many materials, the, uh, the, there's too much uncertainty in the modeling results. And so we have to rely heavily on experimentation, which is slow. And so there's an opportunity with quantum computing to get the high accuracy that we need to really accelerate material discovery and design. Another key area for us um, is potentially in optimization. And this is, we, we use mathematical optimization for many parts of our operation, uh, such as supply chain, logistics optimization. And, you know, just like for the chemistry problem, we have, we, we use classical computing today and we do approximations or heuristics 
but you know we can often only can break the problem into chunks and you know the dream is that quantum computing can help us optimize for example over the entire supply chain or the entire value chain um, rather than just components and you know another area is potentially uh, developing using quantum computing to develop probabilistic scenarios to help um, input into decision making, such as major capital investment decisions, where um, you know there's uncertainty in the future and you want to look at over multiple scenarios. And quantum computing could potentially help us do that in a way that's above and beyond what we can do classically. And you know, just like last, you know, just like at the start of classical computing, where no one could envision how it would transform the world, I think we're going to be using quantum computing for things that we we haven't really thought of yet today. So great potential for energy. Um, that said, uh, we have work to do. Um, we cannot solve business relevant problems today, and it's going to be a while before we can. And, you know, we see three main challenges here. One is that, you know, the hardware needs to continue to improve. And from an algorithmic and workflow point of view, which is, of course, what we're working on in ExxonMobil, um, we need to continue to adapt to the evolving hardware and hopefully also feed back to the hardware development what's critical. A second key challenge is that given the noisy qubits we have today, where we can only do shallow circuits, we need to use hybrid quantum classical algorithms, um, which is where the quantum computer does a computationally component, computationally intensive component, but then we have a classical computer that's extracting information and processing data and helping drive the overall flow of the algorithm. And what we found is that often, you know, while the, the Quantum computing part is, of course, important. The classical component is also important, and we need to often address the scaling of the classical component as we work on larger and larger problems. And the third challenge is that we need to think about the whole computational workflow to get to the business answers to the results that we need for, you know, to actually impact our business. And so, um, and not just the quantum computing component. So for example, for chemistry modeling, we'll start with um, a, uh, a, you know, the electronic ground state calcul energy calculation using the quantum computer, which is great. And hopefully we can do that with very high accuracy compared to classical methods. Um, but then um, we, you, you still have to do multiple steps before you can get to uh, the parameters that really matter, the chemical properties that really matter, um, and those involve classical computing. And the importance, it's going to be important to make sure you can get quantum advantage through that whole workflow. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, we might as well stick with what we have classically. So let me explain uh, how, what our approach is to research in this space. So uh, first of all, um, we're really uh, taking a problem-driven approach and really stepping back to say, um, you know, rather than uh, solve um, the biggest problem we can with the qubits we have, let's work on solving very small, well-defined, you know, baby versions of the problems. Um, and then, you know, doing so have a way to really check our accuracy, um, you know, because we already know the answer and check the accuracy of the entire workflow. And um, uh, so, for example, um, in a chemistry problem, uh, we, we will look today at like hydrogen molecule, the simplest molecules, as opposed to a more complex uh, structure in the future that we might want to look at, like a um, metal organic framework for carbon uh, structure for carbon capture. Or in the optimization side, um, you know, we can look at a very small version of a problem that's important to us, uh, which is a marine inventory routing problem. Um, this is where you have, you know, a product like uh, crude oil or liquefied natural gas at supply ports, and you need it to get to multiple customers, um, and you need an efficient way to dispatch your ships. And the question is, what's the most optimal way to minimize your cost um, in doing so? And so, you know, we might look at a baby problem might be one supply port, three customers, as opposed to the full global fleet with all the, the complexity and, uh, you know, over rich, longer time windows. All right. So taking those baby problems, developing algorithms and workflows, 
you know, the next step is to then see, okay, how do, how can those scale? Can they scale actually? Can you get to quantum advantage? And if, uh, and what are the uh, areas to improve and address the, the bottlenecks and the challenges from the algorithm point of view? And last, you know, quantum computing takes such a different mindset. It really takes a while to build up skills and capabilities in this area, which is why we got started now. And so um, we, uh, this is a collaboration we're doing with IBM, where IBM is, of course, developing the hardware. Um, and both ExxonMobil and IBM are working on algorithm development and workflow development for problems that matter in energy. And we're doing this in an interdisciplinary way where we're bringing you know, our mathematicians, our optimization experts, uh, chemists, material scientists, and approaching this in an interdisciplinary way, integrated way, so that hopefully we can get to the business relevant problems faster. So let me uh, now walk you through how we're using, uh, how, you know, our collaboration with IBM and how we're looking at workflows for different you know, baby versions of the problem um, and seeing what we're learning from that. So I'm going to start with a chemistry problem. And this is where we're looking at um, calculating, you know, uh, the full thermodynamic, you know, going all the way to the thermodynamic properties that matter, that we really need, macroscopic, observable, measurable parameters. And um, starts with, uh, you know, description of the material. And again, we're starting with hydrogen because hydrogen is a, uh, you know, of course, it's well-defined. We know what the answer is, and it's been measured very uh, carefully experimentally. So it's a great benchmark to test the accuracy of our entire workflow. The next step then, of course, is the electronic energy calculation, which is where the quantum computer comes in. The, um, and again, we're using this hybrid quantum classical algorithm. And, uh, and then we calculate the electronic energy, the ground state energy for a given interatomic distance. And then we generate a potential energy surface where we're varying that interatomic distance. So each point on this graph is one, um, you know, one uh, step of the quantum computing um, algorithm. So that's not sufficient, though, just to get this uh, potential energy surface. And we need to move to a full quantum mechanical description of the molecule and actually get the vibrational modes and energy levels, which you know, includes the motion of the nuclei. And you know, this is critical because you know, that's what we need to then ultimately calculate, like on the far right, the thermodynamic observables. In other words, the macroscopic measurable chemistry uh, parameters that we need for material design and process design. And, uh, and so here, what we're, we, you know, and here in this case, we measured a particular, or we compared to a particular property of hydrogen, which is heat capacity. And the important thing to know about heat capacity is that it's uh, been extremely well measured by NIST, and so it's an excellent benchmark to compare for the accuracy of our overall workflow. So a couple things about this workflow. So first of all, what we found under the electronic energy calculation piece is that um, the, the current hybrid the current workhorse, the variational quantum eigensolver that you know that is used uh, that a lot of people are using in this space, um, it has uh, there's multiple components. One is, of course, you need to be able to fit your uh, problem into the qubits that you have, um, which is easy for hydrogen, will be harder for, for larger molecules. And you also need to have the right starting point or the right onsets, you know, the right circuit um, to, to use in your quantum computer that is, you know, gets you to close to your starting, uh, you know, ground state wave function. And uh, those are problems that uh, those are problems that will get harder as molecules get bigger, and a lot of people are doing research in that area. What we found is that we also needed to work on the optimizer for the classical component, and that in fact, you know, we needed to make sure we got good convergence of the results. Um, and with the starting point standard optimizer, we were getting too much noise in our potential energy surface, and so we weren't getting the accuracy we needed. And so we provided an improved optimizer. Uh, to that really brought us all the, was able to propagate the accuracy all the way through. The other thing I want to mention here is that you know the the steps, the vibrational modes and the thermodynamic observables, those are done using standard classical methods right now. Um, those will get harder as the molecules get bigger. 
and um, the the you know there's that so there's a there could be a bottleneck there in getting the full accuracy that we need uh, as we get to larger molecules, and so uh, you know that's an important area of research, and many people in the community are working on how to you know potentially doing the vibrational modes using quantum mechanic a uh, quantum computer as well, which is pretty exciting to to see. All right, so now I'm going to walk through um, the uh, the similar overall workflow, but this time for a small logistics problem or a mathematical optimization problem. And so, you know, again, the, you start with um, a problem abstraction. So essentially, how do you think about the problem? You know, how do you diagram the problem out? And again, we're thinking of a baby problem of this maritime inventory routing problem where you have, for example, one supply port and three customers and a sort of a shorter time window over which to provide, you know, what's the optimal uh, reduced cost to supply everybody in this certain time window. And once you've abstracted the problem, you then have to mathematically formulate it. You have to translate that into a math form that, that has a minimization function where you're trying to minimize um, over to reduce cost um, or maximize profits, um, subject to certain constraints, which are essentially things like um, each uh, customer port can be visited only once in the, the time window. And there's different formulations you can write down they, you know, that to describe the same problem, and they have different pros and cons. And by the way, this is a step you would do even if you were solving this problem classically. And some of the, uh, you know, for example, some um, formulations may better handle heterogeneous vehicles, um, which in this case means, you know, big ships or little ships. And by the way, this is a maritime inventory routing problem, but it's also more generally a vehicle routing problem with time windows. So while we're thinking about ships, you could use it for other applications. You then have to translate that and reformulate it in a way that you can feed the quantum computer. We're using the, the standard approach here, which is to use a quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem, or a Cubo. You then run that on your quantum computer, again, using a hybrid quantum classical algorithm. And then, you know, once you optimize your, your circuit, your Cubo, then you can see what's your probability of success, how quickly do you get to an optimal answer depending on the number of times you have to sample the, that, that Cubo circuit? And so those are all the steps to solve a logistics problem um, using a quantum computer. And, uh, you know, we've learned a couple of things here. One is um, we've, you know, these, these steps were the workflow was there before, but what we've done is uh, focused on the specific vehicle routing with time windows problem or the marine inventory routing problem. Um, we looked at multiple formulations and the pros and cons. Um, we tested, evaluated quantum resource needs, and then we also did uh, numerical experiments using simulated quantum devices. So we looked at the whole workflow. Um, we've, you know, and I would say for, for optimization, the jury is still out whether or not we'll be able to get quantum advantage. Um, we, for this type of problem, we have to be, get to a, um, a, uh, to get to a real world sized problem. We need to get to, um, probably 10,000 logical qubits. That's without error correction. And, uh, so, you know, lots of hardware and algorithmic improvement will need to happen to get there. So last, I just want to uh, emphasize that new technology is really important to solve the global energy challenges going forward, and we think that quantum computing can be really transformative in this space, uh, that, though it's uncertain as to how and when we'll get there. And so we believe a problem-driven focus is key, and to really think about the entire computational workflow and look to see that you can get quantum advantage across that whole workflow and to develop hardware and algorithms in an integrated way um, and have an integrated roadmap um, we think will be important. And we're going to need all of R&D in this space. This is a big problem, and it's going to take um, you know, the entire community to solve these challenges, uh, which is why events like today is so, are so critical, is everybody can share the problems that matter in their spaces and talk about um, you know, how, what's that roadmap look like to get to quantum advantage? So thank you for listening.